I'm going to be talking today about the nature of time, historical time and how we can think of the directionality of time or the concept of progress. This is a big issue because the idea of progress and a direction to history is absolutely fundamental to politics or the politics of a progressive movement. You can't define progress unless you consider that there is a direction of history. But the problem is to escape an idealist teleological idea of a direction of history. That it's the unfolding of some imminent purpose that will lead to some definite goal. How can you conceive of a natural material process that will give rise to a directionality? We all know the standard Marxist concept of historical progress. You start off with clan society, move through to slave society, feudal, capitalist, then socialist. And off to the side, there's the Asiatic mode of production. This is the standard view you're given. But there are problems with this. The Asiatic mode of production is literally out on a limb. Uh, indeed, there's a lot of controversy among historians in the Indian subcontinent as to whether it really existed and was distinct from feudalism. On the other hand, if we admit that it existed and that you now have capitalism in India or Pakistan, then the scheme is too simple because it implies there must be a possible transition from the Asiatic mode of production to capitalism. Also, since the fall of the USSR, we know that transitions can go two ways. The transition to socialism is not one way. Countries can revert to capitalism. So again, the scheme is too simple. What alternative ways can we use to think about progress? Well, the starting point for contingent historical reasons to do with uh, the intellectual background of 19th century Germany, where Marx and Dietschgen were, edit were, were educated, is to start off with dialectics, the concept of negation, negation of the negation, etc. On the other hand, in the 20th century, other approaches have become possible. You can start off from the ideas of the Russian theorist Markov, or you could use ideas of um, thermodynamic directions of time, which come from starting the, the work of Boltzmann in the 1880s. Or you can take a technological determinist idea of what causes a direction to time. Starting with the dialectical analysis, because this is what people schooled in the Marxist tradition are familiar with, there's a problem with it in that there's a limit to what you can conceptualise with simple concepts like negation and negation of the negation. We know that if you use static logic, an expression like not not a is equal to a, in that two negations cancel out. So if you have that, you have no change, you have no dynamics. But if you have, instead of static logic, dynamic logic, or what in electronics you'd call a state machine, something which evolves through time, you can get that by having feedback. Now, here I've shown a simple digital circuit, which is an oscillator. We have an, a not operator here, Schmidt trigger, with a, an inverting Schmidt trigger. We feed its output back through a resistor to its input. The effect of this is that the negation of negation generates a square wave. We start off with this positive, that goes negative, it feeds back, pulls this down, which becomes negative, and that becomes positive again. So the effect of negation and negation is actually to generate a square wave. And we have a little circuit like that in almost every computer, which generates the original clock circuit, or the original clock fre frequency of the circuit. The problem with oscillation, so we've got negation and negation become, giving rise to becoming, but oscillation is all that you can get 
out of this conceptual apparatus. That's not to say it's useless. This idea of negation of negation is the implicit basis of Turkin's secular cycle model of history. Now, secular cycle theory does account for class struggle and many real historical cycles. Turkin documents examples of these cycles in his books. The basic model is you go between prosperous periods when population grows and the income of the poor is relatively well off, therefore they, they increase their numbers. The effect of increasing population, however, is that it leads the poor to be more vulnerable to exploitation. The upper classes prosper and poverty increases. After a while, the limits of the carrying capacity of the ecosystem are reached and surplus revenue for the upper classes starts to stagnate because the absolute product of the land doesn't grow as fast as the number of people going on it, whereas the food that has to be fed to support those workers has an irreducible minimum and therefore the amount of surplus revenue stagnates. You then get increasing competition among the upper classes who launch either wars of conquest or civil wars to fight over a declining surplus. War, famine, pestilence and death, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, then follow. Population declines and the poor are gradually able to win better conditions. And then you go back to step one. Turkin illustrates many of these cycles. Um, this is roughly the time cycle he gives for them. A growth period of 100 years, a turning period of 50 to 60 years, 20 to 50 year crisis, an intercycle, and then the cycle starts again. Here's the example he gives for that process occurring in the United States. This shows indices of the well-being of the working classes. This shows indices of the prosperity of the upper classes. And they move in inverse proportion and generate this cycle. So in his model, class struggle is the motor of history, but it is just a secular history, a cyclical history. It's just an endless cycle of class struggle with hope for a, without hope for an end or any progress. So saying the class struggle is the motor of history is not enough. It gives you change, but it doesn't give you progress. An alternative approach is to use Markov models. These are known after the Russian mathematician Markov, who developed them for the analysis of text production or written text as a probabilistic model for the occurrence of letters in text. And Markov models are very widely used in areas like data compression of text, data compression of music, etc. But in principle, they can be used to analyze any system which has an identifiable set of discrete states and transitions between these states. So here is the same set of um, or similar set of what you might call modes of production or forms of economy and possible transitions between them. Clan society can go to peasant economy. That can then go to slave economy. It can go back to peasant economy. On the other hand, clan society can move directly to slave economy. Peasant economies can develop into socialist economies or into capitalist economies and capitalist and socialist economies can interchange. Now, I've given letters to these because the letters will correspond to some historical examples. The first one, transition from a clan society to a socialist society, well that would be Mongolia, which became the second socialist state after the Russian Revolution, moved from a clan society to a socialist economy. Um, B is the what historians starting with Engels call the German transition out of clan society, um, the transition to feudalism which occurred in Western Europe after the Germanic invasions in the uh, 5th century. 
C transition to slave economy which occurred in West Africa um, in places like Sokotu. The we can go on. Um, the Chinese Revolution is an example of a peasant economy undergoing a, a transition to to socialist economy. We had a peasant economy going to a capitalist economy in Britain. In F, we have an example of a, cap a developed capitalist economy moving to a socialist economy, and that would be East Germany uh, after the Second World War. Um, G, the transition from a peasant economy to a slave economy, that occurred during the Roman Republic, uh, analyzed by many historians, including Turkin, by the way. Um, the transition from a slave economy to a peasant economy or nascent feudalism occurred in the late Roman Empire uh, with an institution called the colonnade, which is seen as the, um, the first stage of feudalism. And the transition from capitalism from socialism back to capitalism, number I, well, we have the example of Russia in the 1990s. Now, the nice thing about a Markov model is that it does give you the possibility of direction. You can get direction in one case if not all transitions are possible. For instance, if there are no transitions back to clan society, and you have a world initially filled with clan societies, over time, it means the probability of society staying in the clan state decreases and you'll get a mix of societies in the other states. You can also get a directionality if certain transitions are more likely than others. Transitions from, if transitions from socialism, transitions to socialism are more likely, than transitions from capitalism to socialism, over time societies will become more and more socialist, or more and more societies will become socialist. So Markov models can give you direction, but the treatment of evolution in Markov models is probabilistic, it's not deterministic. It says that each year there's a certain probability of a transition, very low in each individual year. Over each century, the probability becomes more significant. Now, it can be said that if you're talking in terms of probabilities, you're already moving towards a thermodynamic conception of historical change. Because we know that in the universe as a whole, there's a direction of time given by the tendency of entropy to increase. What this means at a more fundamental level is that systems with a higher entropy are more probable because entropy is a function of probability, positive function of probability. So over time, systems in an improbable state are more likely to move to a more probable state. And that is what the law of the increase of entropy amounts to. And this is analogous to the notion of change in Markov models. So there's a certain similarity. But the problem with thermodynamic concepts has been that it hasn't been possible to think of organized systems like life or society. Surely these should be very improbable because they are non-random. But Recent advances in thermodynamics, particularly the work of England, has shown that if you have an energy flow through a system, the system will reorganize itself in order to maximize this flow. And England argues that that's what life does, and it gives thermodynamic reasons why life will necessarily evolve in natural systems where there is such an energy gradient, whether the energy gradient is at the bottom of the sea by a hydrothermal vent, or it is on the surface of the land or the surface of the sea subject to light from the sun. Now, he's saying that if you have a natural system with an energy flow through it, it will tend 
sort itself into a state that subsystems arise which are ordered which enable you to maximize the flow of entropy through uh, the maximize the increase in entropy through the system now you can apply that sort of concept to certain historical examples in particular you can apply it to the biggest revolution that's occurred in human history which is the movement from hunter-gatherer society through herding society to agricultural society. In biology you talk about trophic levels, levels of organisms that feed on one another. Down at the bottom you've got plants, on top of that you've got herbivores which are level two and on top of that you've got carnivores like the wolf which feed on the herbivores. Now the historical progress of human society has been down this pyramid but as you move down the pyramid you get access to more and more energy. There is much more energy captured by plants than is available in the herbivores which eat the plants and you have the least energy and the least uh, biomass at the top level of the trophic system. So as we move down from being equivalent of wolves, we gain access to more energy. That means that herding will displace hunting and farming in the end will displace herding if the land allows for it because the social systems based on herding support a larger population who will displace the hunters and we see this happening right down to the current day where the last remaining hunter-gatherers in East Africa are being displaced by Maasai herders and historically over time although there was a long period of conflict between herding societies and agricultural societies in the end the agricultural societies move one out because they could support larger populations. These thermodynamic concepts actually sit very well with the Marxist tradition because the Marxist tradition is in the end a technological determinism. As Marx said, the hand mill gives you the feudal lord, the steam mill, the industrial capitalist. The direction of history is given by the fact that modes of production that harness more energy can displace those that, dis that can harness less energy. In classical Marxism, this is understood in terms of the rubric productive forces. It may be better to think of this in terms of productive power, since this links it to the energy flow available. Power is measured in gigawatts, which is a measure of energy flow per second. So societies with greater productive power, with greater energy resources, whether these are from natural biological energy sources, from fossil fuel sources, or in the future from a mixture of direct capture of solar energy and um, the direct harnessing of nuclear fusion, these societies will displace those which have lower levels of energy available. And this intuition is behind Lenin's uh, slogan that communism is Soviet power plus electrification of the whole country.